I'd like to call the meeting on June 8, 2021 to order at 7.01. Uh, I'd like to review the minutes from May 11th. Motion to accept. Second. Thank you, Bill. Um, roll call, Bob. Yes. Lynn. Yeah. Bill. Yes. Yes. Olivia. Yes. Judy. Yes. Damien. Yes. Keith. Yes. Missy. Yes. And and Bill. Yes. And there's still no Mary, right? Okay. Mary's coming. She just did a two-hour Deerfield meeting. She had to take care of some business before coming on the next one. Okay. Thanks. Shelly, you there? I'm here. Sorry. Well, I just figured I'd give you a little heads up. Are you ready for us for a financial report? Yeah. Yes, you are. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so you all, uh, no, not not everybody. I do this every time. So Mr. Hollis signed 18 warrants after reviewing them on your behalf. Um, total was $1,746,332.56. Um, I shared out the expense reports today. I actually did a year-to-date report, even though my um, update said through May 31st, I decided the last minute to go ahead with the year to date so that I could get a more realistic number of where our balance is at the end of the year. Uh, but like I said last month, you know, I would be analyzing uh, each account line really closely to see where we are with overages and um, savings on certain accounts. So given the savings that we have from some lines such as transportation or athletics or professional development that we would normally in a typical year fully spend down. Um, I went ahead and made some adjustments already. So I moved some things off of school choice onto the general fund uh, to eat up some of those balances. Um, we had some pretty significant savings this year in special education transportation, particularly because our out of district students um, didn't start being transported out of district off the get go in September. A lot of the programs that they were in were still remote for several months, even though our district was partially in person. So I've made some adjustments there already. And then I'll keep looking at the account lines. Um, we do still have some expenses that'll go in over the next three to four weeks to uh, finish out the year. Um, but there may be some additional reclassifications once I get a better handle on all of our free cash. So um, we'll start our audit as soon as we can. I already have a bug in the ear of our auditor so that we can get a jump start on that this year. Last year, we didn't get our free cash certified until almost the last possible minute. Um, and I want to be ahead of the game on that moving into fiscal year 22. Um, and then the only other update was uh, last month, you voted to use e and and withdraw our capital warrants. So Darius and I sent out a letter to each of the town administrators about that. Um, we heard back from several of them, I think, all but one so far that there wasn't going to be any question and we imagine that there won't be anything um, problematic moving forward. So I will go ahead and make the adjustment to the budget because we take that money and we add it into this year and then we'll get those expenses encumbered so that we can take care of those projects that we talked about last meeting. Any questions before I keep going on revolving funds? I know we have a big agenda so I'm going to talk fast and <laughs> move us along but jump in and stop me. Um, just to let just to let you know, Sally, the Con Conway did approve that the, the Conway already approved the E and D, and and, uh, and 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 at the town meeting, the motion to withdraw that to table that article actually uh, uh, was not unanimous. There were numerous no votes that still wanted <laughs> to pay that. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah. That was very interesting. I'm not sure if they were actually no votes or maybe like clicker malfunction, but. <laughs> Who knows? Um, okay, so I have promised you a revolving fund update. You know, things are still a little bit of a moving target as we go through the rest of the year. But, you know, I have some rough numbers for you at this point based on what we anticipate the year looking like. Um, so our school choice is expected to be higher coming in than we had budgeted for revenue. 
uh, due to some special education increment claims bringing up our revenue and our expenses will be lower because I did already make some reclassifications based on the savings that I previously discussed. Um, so we've been able to add some additional funds to school choice. So our original projection was around 1.1 million to end the year and we're looking to be about 1.3. Um, so we've added some funds back into school choice. So that's good news because going into next year, you never know what we're going to need um, those funds for. We do not have funds in our capitalization stabilization fund, um, which Phil, I did find out Frontier does have. That was a question from the last meeting if we have a capital stabilization fund. And we do, but there's no money in it. So um, essentially, if the boiler were to go, school choice would be one of those places that we're looking to take funds from. So it's good to have a, a positive balance in there. Um, so moving ahead to next year, uh, we are looking at starting the year at 1.3, revenues expected about 250,000. Our expenses are exceeding our revenue at just shy of 400,000. So we're looking at ending the year around 1.2 million uh, for school choice. Um, Darius, do you wanna share, do you mind? Thank you, he's doing it. As I'm trying to flip back and forth so I can see you and <laughs> read the report at the same time. So. Thank you. Um, so we're in a good spot with school choice. I feel like you know we, we've, we've gotten everything that we need for this school, but at the same time made sure that we're still saving and not overexpend. Um, so looking ahead at school lunch, uh, we started the year with about 19,000. Um, we did pay all of our staff last year, so that ate up a good chunk of our surplus. Um, our revenue year to date has exceeded what my expectations were, um, primarily because in the months of April and May, we've brought in a significant amount of money. Uh, the reimbursement rate from federal and state is actually higher than what a cash paying lunch would be. Um, so our revenues are still down significantly because we haven't had um, all those a la carte options that we would have had in a previous year. Um, so revenue normally would probably be at least double this, but considering where we were last June, not knowing what this year would look like, I'm really happy with what we've brought in so far. So our payroll expenses, um, we moved those off onto the general fund so they're not being paid from the revolving account. So our expenses year to date are just food and supply costs. Um, so we're looking at ending the year with a positive net income of 65,000 for our total revolving fund balance of 85,000. So what does that look like for fiscal year 22? Uh, we start off in a good spot. Um, I'm expecting at least revenue of 125,000. I'm really conservative here. Um, that should be significantly higher, but I didn't want to make promises or speak to what our, particularly our a la carte options are going to look like. Um, our new food service director is still working on, you know, can kids just go grab and go chips and get things on their own? Or are we going to have tighter restrictions where we have to have someone serving those things? Or are we going to have to limit our options? So um, again, really conservative here and want to be prepared in the event that we can't do that. But 125,000 in anticipated revenue with about 86 in expenses. Um, so we'll be looking at ending the year at almost 125,000. Um, part of the reason we're able to do that is because we are going to use ESSER funds, that ESSER 2 grant, to pay for some of our school lunch wages. Some are already on general fund built into our budget, um, but a good chunk of them will be paid with this grant. So building up our reserve, uh, we normally wouldn't carry 125000 in a school lunch revolving account. But this will allow us to be prepared for fiscal year 23 so that when we no longer have the grant and have to move wages back to the revolving fund, we have a good surplus balance available. Um, and lunch will be free for all students again next year. USDA has extended that free meal option. So, um, you know, it, it's really great for a, a good chunk of our community. And if our numbers stay the way that they have been for May going into next year, we're going to far exceed that conservative revenue amount of 125,000. Um, so I think we also have revolving fund, I think is the last piece to talk about now. Uh, so our revolving fund is also in good shape. This isn't a fund that we um, have a lot of discussion about because for the most part, it has built up enough to fund itself over the years. Um, so this year we came in with just shy of 500,000 anticipated revenue about 180. We are exceeding our revenue that we're bringing in with, with expenses. Um, so that's something that we should talk about moving forward of do we wanna 
pull our expenses back a little bit. Um, we don't want to put out more than we're bringing in for year after year after year because we will deplete our surplus. But right now, at $410,000, we are still in a good spot. Uh, revenue looks to be about the same next year. And our expenses, dearest, can you scroll down for me because I do not have this memorized. Um, our expenses will be just shy of what they were this year. So we are still in that um, negative net income, but overall still a really good healthy balance of 350000 to have in the special education revolving account. You know, this surplus, um, for anyone who doesn't fully understand the numbers that might be watching or listening, um, it allows us to have a cushion in the event that we have an out-of-district placement that is unexpected. Um, if we had to hire additional IAs for one-to-one -one services or things like that. So, you know, it's good to have a, a nice amount of money in there. But um, moving forward, we'll want to take a little bit closer look at it and maybe dial back our expenses a bit so we're not overexpending. But again, overall, I think compared to last June when I gave this report, we are in a far better position than I think any of us thought we would be. Um, we were really fortunate this year to get a lot of grant funding federally and locally. Um, and that the town supported a lot of our COVID related needs and that we've been fortunate to build back up some of these accounts because we really had no idea what it was gonna look like at the end of the year. Um, so I think that sums it up. There's one more thing on here, but it's not till a later um, vote that we're gonna talk about under new business, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them about that quick summary or the expense reports. Shelly, we're going to have a problem with the excess that we have in this year's budget with E and D for next year. I don't believe that we're going to have a problem. That's part of what we're going to talk about with the transportation reimbursement, um, because we very well could be given just transportation reimbursement alone. Um, but that's part of the reason that we're doing some reclassifications already. Uh, you know, accounts where we may have have savings. You know, transportation between special ed and regular ed, the transportation savings um, to the budget were over $100,000 this year. So we, we could be in a bad spot if we didn't have the flexibility to sort of move funds around and build up our, our school choice again um, for unforeseen expenditures moving forward. Um, but I think we're gonna be okay. You know, and the, the auditor will give us guidance as we go through the process and let us know if there's any additional adjustments we can make. So um, what happens if we are over that 5% um, because we've already set next year's budget, the, the difference would go to offsetting the 23 assessment. So, you know, even if we did go over, um, it will go back to the towns by way of adjustment of the assessment. It would just be one more fiscal year out since fiscal year 22 is already done. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Have? Keith? Yeah, just one quick question. Um, I'm looking at the, the expenditure reports, the general fund expenditure. It looks great, but then the school committee expenditure has like a, a six, 676, negative 676. And I was just wondering what, if you could explain. I didn't understand that. Yeah, let me pull it up, Keith, really quick. I don't have that open in front of me. One thing that I do know happened, are you on the first page in that first function code? I'm on this, the, just the, the grand total second page at the end of that two-page report. Okay. Bob bought a new fishing boat and he named it, <laughs> he named it school committee or chair. And so that's where that expense came from. Okay. Got it, thank you. Hey, Bottom the of the second page. Uh, not not the general fund, but the school committee monthly. Oh, the school. Report. Oh, the school choice expense. Okay. Oh, sorry, school choice, yeah. Okay, so this is a little bit tricky to understand. So we're not actually negative the six hundred thousand. What happens with school choice and charter is, and if I'm talking too fast or you need me to repeat it, let me know. What we have to do here is pay out all of our expenses to school choice and charter tuitions from this account. But what you're not seeing, Keith, is all of our choice and all of our charter coming in. Got it. So when I talk about, when I do a financial report and I talk about for school choice, our revenue is gonna be 275,000 next year. If you actually look at the cherry sheet, the state shows our revenue of like 1.3 million. I only account for the net in my financial reports. 
So what we bring in, what we pay out, the net is what we account for. But when you look at this report, it shows dollar for dollar what we're paying out for students going out of district for choice and charter. So it's a little bit deceiving when you look at it this way. Um, I could see if there's a different report that I can generate next year if you guys were interested in looking at it in a different light um, to show that net income because it is tricky. It's it confuses your brain. I could also exclude those accounts so that you don't even see them, but that doesn't feel very transparent either. I like the transparency. I don't necessarily like more reports. I appreciate you explaining to me. No problem. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Shelly. Anybody else? And, uh, you know, I did take that boat. I see we have a lot of new sports. So I was hoping maybe we can incorporate the fishing boat into part of Carl's new uh, sports. Maybe we have fishing at Frontier against other schools, maybe. Carl, can we take that on our advisement, maybe? Sure, no problem. The more things we can offer, the better. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, public comment. And I think we have Jennifer still around. Did you have something to read tonight, Jennifer? I do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as you know, I am Jennifer Smith, and I teach fourth grade at DES. I spent a great deal of time this year working on our anti-racism professional development plans, revising curriculum to have a more culturally responsive lens, and working with our student group at the elementary school to infuse diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism into our larger school community, including writing support letters that were sent out to families on a monthly basis to continue this education at home. Back in March, I brought the first pathway, identity and white privilege, to the school committee members and invited you to begin your own work, mirroring, mirroring what the teachers have been working on this year. As mostly white people in this community, it's important to step into this work and prioritize it. It's all too easy to speak to the work, but then put it down, allowing others to do the work for us. If there is a true commitment to changing the systems in place that allow racism to stay rooted in our community, then we cannot let the work go on around us. There has to be a constant effort to keep at it, keep thinking, keep pushing. This is difficult to do alone, which is why it was so much more powerful when the teachers worked in small groups, watching or reading material, and then discussing it together, holding each other accountable to keep coming back to the work and not just let it go and go back to being comfortable again. Staying comfortable means that we're allowing racism to stay systemized in our schools and community. It's easy to say that we're busy and that we'll get to it later. But then I think about the kids in our schools whose year is ending and they still don't see themselves represented. They still don't hear their stories being told in history and they still don't see the adults prioritizing them in our schools. There are always reasons not to do it, to wait until later. But if that was your child feeling devalued, you would do the work to find out what should be done to fully support them. Tonight, I would love to hear from anyone here about how the pathways are going for you. Have you gone through some of it on your own or with others? What has stood out to you from the pathways so far? Is there something that's getting in your way from keeping you going through the pathway? I would also like to extend an inv invitation for you to begin a second pathway, a history of racism this summer and I encourage you to work on it with someone else to help you stay accountable to the work. I appreciate your time and attention tonight. We have an amazing school district, and I know that with more people getting fully invested in this work, we can become a stronger and more welcoming com community. Thanks, Jen. Did anybody have questions for Jennifer? Okay. Has anyone begun the work with the pathways that they could share or? Not yet. I think we're talking, actually we're talking about it later on in our, um, in the agenda tonight, a little bit later on. Correct me if I'm wrong, Darius. 
You're correct. Thanks. I'll stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a new student council reporter, and I think her name is Abigail. Is she on? Yes, that is I. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Abigail, as you just said. Um, I am one of the um, I'm one of the co-presidents for next year. Um, I guess I'll start with some of our plans that we have already brainstormed. So um, as I just stated, the elected officers, officers for next year are Harry and I as co-presidents, replacing the roles of vice president and um, president. I'm sure that's already been mentioned, though. Um, Bianca Pura as secretary, Natalie Dexter as treasurer, and Angelina Egland as social media manager and e-board representative. So far, we plan to continue um, the tradition of arranging Spirit Week, the pep rally, and field day. And we are also planning on attending some or all of the statewide student council events, which are usually hosted by the e-board. Um, we have discussed adding some new activities to Spirit Week and the pep rally just to make things a bit more interesting for the student council, um, sorry, student body. Um, in the past, last year actually, we um, added some new games and people really liked it and they had a kick out of it. So, that was, so um, you know, we're looking to doing more of that. Um, last school year, we were actually in the midst of um, getting school merchandise and possibly student council merchandise in addition, but then COVID hit. Um, but we plan on resuming those, um, we plan on resuming those plans next year, especially since we actually promised merch as a prize um, to the Spirit Week winners um, for the competition, or like the little competition we held since we were completely virtual at the time, or well, most of us were virtual at the time. Um, we also were um, interested in maybe arranging a winter dance. This this seems like a big feat, but currently Harry and I are very enthusiastic about it. And we plan on sharing this idea with the rest of the student council next year right away. Um, yeah, we have a lot of ideas for it. Um, then of course, uh, many of the plans I've mentioned require funding. So we plan on hosting events such as fundraisers if necessary for the student council in order to meet the financial requirements for our optimistic ideas. Um, so that's all we are looking forward to for next year currently. But of course, um, we um, are looking to find new members and we will handle any requests that may come our way next year. Thanks, Abigail. Anybody have questions for her? Oops. Well, thank Can you I very much. Well, well, no, 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 Bob, Bob, Bob. I just need Abigail's last name because if you're going to be with us for a year, I would like to know your last name. Oh yeah, of course. Um, my last name is Goff, Abigail Goff, G-O-F-F. -F. Okay. Abigail, this is Phil Cantor from the Conway Rep. I just wanted to say that was an excellent report. Congratulations Whoops. on your election or appointment or whatever and uh, <laughs> um, keep up the good work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Bob, could okay, I ask if there was a second um, public comment letter well, sent in? I was say just going to say, I, I, I two more letters and I, that said they needed to be read in to the um, meeting during public comment. I didn't know. I mean, I'm happy to do that or if you wanted to do that. I just didn't know if we had remembered that there were two more letters. I I didn't. Who were they? Okay, you can, you can read them, Olivia, if you like. Um, okay. Um, good thing I have two screens. So this first one that I have here is from um, Lou Vincent, and she asked that it be read at all of the committees meetings, but I'm not going to be there, so I'll read it at this one. Um, dear school committee members and administrators, I would like to thank you all for your hard work and continuous commitment to our schools. I would also like to thank you for being receptive to exploring and undertaking personal and professional development in relation to anti-racism and equity. As you know, our schools have made a commitment to addressing long neglected aspects of our systems and community in regard to equity and racism. Administrators, teachers, and parents are enthusiastically entering into self and community education and are developing a growing understanding of equity in the world and in our community. 
The Pathways Professional Development Plan put forth by fourth grade DES teacher Jen Smith, Jennifer, sorry, Smith, presented to you at a recent school committee meeting, offers a thorough and thoughtful avenue for community members to grow, to gain knowledge of self and systems, and to become a more educated person in our community. This is ongoing work for us all. This professional development developed by Ms. Smith has been embraced at the elementary schools with the support of elementary administration, curriculum director Kim McCarthy, advisor to the FRSU 38 Anti-Racism and Equity Task Force, Amanda Mosea, and the Collaborative for Educational Services. As I am sure you are all aware, it is vital for school committee members to be educated and up to date as to how to best serve our community. Many of you indicated that school committee at that school committee meeting that you would be interested in taking this uh, professional development. I applaud this intention. To follow up on Jennifer Smith's offer to you to take this professional development, I would like to offer my services and that of other Deerfield Inclusion Group volunteers to act as collaborators and assist you in transversing the professional development. Aspects of the professional development will best be done with small group participation and Deerfield Inclusion Group would like to offer our presence and support to do this with you and offer a type of buddy system as you work through it. Many DIG, which is Deerfield Inclusion Group, members have been actively working on issues of equity and anti-racism personally and professionally and provide a meaningful resource. DIG would be honored to partner with you in the work of equity and anti-racism professional and personal development, recognizing the ongoing need for learning and community. I have been engaged in anti-racism work for 16 years. I am a co-founder of DIG and a parent to children of color in our school district. I am a former intern with the Collaborative for Educational Services, a member of the Sunderland Human Rights Task Force, a Mount Holyoke College student working on a thesis on race, racism, and power. I understand that doing the work of unpacking your own bias and examining parts of ourselves and our country's history can be deeply challenging. I would like to offer my support and availability to you this summer as you undertake this professional development. I am proposing that we organize two or three sessions over the summer where school committee members and DIG members can meet to review how the professional development is going, the process, questions, feelings, and just in general as a way to connect while doing this hard work. If school committee members are interested in this suggestion, I'll be happy to facilitate a few days to make this happen. I look forward to connecting. Many thanks, Lou Vinny. There was another one, I think, Emily Krems. I can yep. pull that up unless somebody has it and wants to read it. Um, hold on. I have it. Okay. Do you mind reading it, Judy? Nope, sure. Uh, this is for Emily Krems. Dear Frontier School Committee members, in the past year, there have been significant initiatives undertaken by members of the Frontier Regional Community to move the district towards becoming a more equitable and inclusive for all students. This work does not occur, occur without support from the individuals tasked with looking at the larger picture and deciding on the directions to take as a district. And so I would like to acknowledge and show appreciation for your support for moving the district in this direction. All of our students, those who belong to the groups that hold power, and those who belong to marginalized groups benefit from these efforts. And there is always much more that can be done and the work never ends. We are fortunate to have an individual within the district, fourth grade teacher, Jennifer Smith, who has worked tirelessly to create a professional development curriculum to help move this work forward. Elementary staff have undergone the PD and have voiced praise for it. I am aware that the school committee members are planning to do some PD around equity and inclusion, and I am writing to encourage you to consider embarking specifically on this transformative PD. Thank you again for your support of this crucial work. Emily Krems, eighth grade parent. Thank you, Judy. Sure. And I was looking at my email. I got I got Emily's today and, and I didn't get Lou Vincent's one, so I apologize for not doing it earlier. Um, unfinished business, uh, COVID update, summer planning, Darius? Uh, nothing really big there. We do have a lot of summer programs happening. There's been mixed um, information coming out of the state. They first started talking about how adults could be unmasked in the building during summer programs when, as long as they're vaccinated when working with students. And then they changed and reverted back to basically the policies we have now that all everyone's masked in the buildings for summer programs. Um, a lot of politics being played state, statewide back and forth on that. So um, that's kind of where we are in the latest of COVID kind of terms. So we're wrapping up the school year this year um, and 
you know, <clears throat> you'll see, we'll see where we are. Just open up the school year next year, you know, um, and essentially I'll be coming to you with whatever we need to put into place for that. So outside of that, um, summer programs will be run like last week of school is being run um, as far as COVID, COVID procedures. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Darius on that? Uh, yeah. Anthony, uh, uh, sorry, I, Bob, I do have a question. Okay, David. Um, Darius, if you just clarify, um, because with with the mandates on on, on mask usage, and and I, and I know what we're doing right now, and the school year is almost over, and the way it's going to be this summer, um, we are following under what the 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 school guidelines are saying, even though the state guidelines have been lifted for mask usage in, you know, I, mean, I go to the grocery store now, I don't have to wear it. So, I, I mean, I guess what, what we're following is separate from, yeah. from what so, the state. Yeah, let me explain that. So the state lifted the mask mandate, but the, um, they did keep it in schools through the remainder of this school year. Okay, so masks are required by DESE and the Department of um, Public Health in school buildings for the, the remainder of the 2021 school year. And then, um, except we're outside, and that's when we'll be looking at the fast mask mandate, uh, mask policy, where I kind of just went ahead and allowed students to be outside with their masks off and do activities outside with their masks off, and, and we're catching up with the policy on that. So, what we don't know is what they're going to say come start of the FY22 school year. So, I, I'm saying FY, but next school year. So, that's all we talk about is budget right here. Um, so. That's what I'm saying is we'll see what those things are and how those things play out. So yes, you are correct. However, the law the, the laws are saying right now that masks are in school, they aren't in the supermarket. Why are they different? You know, long periods of time in the same classroom, you know, that kind of stuff. They, they're trying to ease out of this. It took a lot to get people back in the building. There's politics. There's also, you know, where else are you having, you know, changing numbers of people entering combined spaces like you are having in public schools? Um, so they're probably you know easing outside of that too, and people aren't vaccinated. It's the one group that's not vaccinated as well. So, um, other frontier for the most part, numbers are pretty, or I would say over fifty percent at this point that are vaccinated are all well on their way. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting with next spring, with next fall brings because we may have a student body that's vaccinated, but the elementary schools aren't. So we might have to have different things going on between different age groups and such. Um, and then why the adults wearing masks? You know, because they. We're finding out that some people still get it. And so this kind of, we're catching up. You know, we're on a, what do you call it? A treadmill on this thing. I'm sure Missy <laughs> okay. will give us better insight. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll go right over to Andy. Raise his hands up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually, I was curious where oh, Frontier was in terms of vaccination rate. So, uh, by the way, how I can do it is basically when I asked, we're running our clinic, we run the second day of our clinic on Friday. So going into our clinic, we had about 130 students say, or families say that they're not interested in um, vaccination because they already have it. Because that was one of the options I had. I already have it or I'm in the process of. So we had 130 and then we had around 200 sign up for the vaccination clinic. So between that, this puts us around 300 and change. I imagine even more students are going there. So you're talking about two thirds of our population through those numbers are vaccinated. I don't know the last group, the last 200 or so could be people didn't feel like taking the survey, you know, that kind of stuff. Are they getting it outside that kind of stuff or they're not getting it. So that's, that's the information I got. Thanks. Does anybody else have anything else before I go on? Okay, uh, do we have the subcommittee from the anti-racism and equality for an update? So there's no report to no official report tonight on that. Um, I did talk with um, Kelsey and just to, in summary, they did have their um, end of year meeting to look at goals for next year. The two main themes coming out of the meeting is focusing on communication, sustainability of the work that's being done um, rolling into next year. So a lot of other smaller stuff, but um, those are the two main focus points and she'll give a full report from September. Thank you. Carl, now it's your turn, Carl. That's All right. Your fees. 
Yeah, so uh, I just want to start with thank you to the school committee for all the all your work this year. I uh, I got a being a new athletic director, I certainly felt supported by the uh, the AD by administration and the school committee. Um, it's it certainly has been an interesting uh, start to my career as an athletic director. But I, I really can't thank you everyone enough for uh, the support I've, I've gotten through emails and through everything kind of this year. So I wanted to start with that. Um, now on to my wonderful three-page thing that uh, Donna Hathaway shared with you all. I'll, I'll try to be as fast as possible. Uh, first, an update, middle school football. So we're taking a proactive step here. Uh, basically, the schools around us are, don't have the numbers for middle school football, and they're dropping their programs. So if we continue with our middle school program as is, um, we're basically not going to have anybody to play. Um, so talking to Scott Dredge, who has been a integral part of the suburban program in the area for the younger grades, um, we basically reached out to them and said, hey, would you be interested in adding uh, Frontier as a senior league, which is middle school grades, team to the, to the suburban league? Um, after a bunch of meetings, they said they would take us. Um, and this, this basically will allow our kids to have a full eight game schedule plus playoffs. Um, the downside is we lose, I don't know what word to use control, I guess, of them, uh, in the sense that, you know, we don't oversee it, but if we're doing, trying to do what's in the best interest of those kids interested in playing the sport, then this is kind of why we made that decision. Um, another small thing that could, could help us is that being a senior division team in the suburban league. Uh, kids from surrounding towns, um, not in our district, could be part of it. Which um, you know, there are a few kids going through that league that you know, Hatfield kids, Hadley kids that have played and made connections, and you know, that might help us get a few kids to come here going forward too. So um, that's the update on middle school football. I don't know if you have questions about that. Uh, at any time, I guess wave at me, and if you have questions about any of these things, going over. But um, Hey, so, Carl, do you want me to present your presentation as you go through it just sure. so they can follow along and then you can see yep. them as you do it? That'd be great. Will do. Thanks, Darius. So no questions in the middle school? Oop. Bringing that up slowly Oop. here. Oop. Where the heck is it? <laughs> there it is. There it is. All right. There's kind of what I just said. Yay. Thanks, Darius. All right. So the, the next kind of parts here are things we're looking to add some, some athletic opportunities for kids. Um, so I guess the first thing is why do this? We have a really robust athletic program as it is. Um, but I think one of the main things that we learned during this past year is the importance of kids staying connected, being involved, um, having something to do and not just sitting at home. Um, at our school now, oh, I got my numbers right here. In the fall season, we have about 300, just over 300 kids who play a fall sport. Now that's more than half of our kids. In the winter, that drops down to about 100 kids uh, with less sports offered. And then in the spring, goes back up to about 200. So my, my thought process behind this is um, I want to get those numbers in the other seasons up because there's 300 kids that want to do something in the fall. Like let's give them some more opportunities. So I've been kind of seeing what works, sending out surveys, and that's why I'm here in front of you tonight. So the, the first thing is co-op swimming with uh, Turner's Falls. So Turner's Falls approached me. They're getting low in numbers. They're the only swim program in, in Franklin County and their numbers are getting low. I said, hey, do you think you'd have any kids? I sent out a survey, got 15 responses. Um, eight said yes. Um, one of the worries with adding sports is taking kids from other sports. Um, we don't wanna like, you know, take from one team and then not have enough. But uh, in our responses here, um, only one, person plays basketball the others don't play a winter sport and basketball is one of those sports that makes cuts so we're not really losing any participation uh, we're offering more stuff um things with the co-op the families supply that supply their own transportation just like all the other co-ops that we have uh minimal cost really the only cost for us is um an additional like league fee through the mia and the pbiac but other than that the, the turners doesn't charge our kids a user fee um and it's all been approved through our um, athletic director steps. It's basically just a school committee kind of stamp of approval if you are so inclined. Which brings me, my question, I don't know if you want to go like one at a time on these and vote on them or you want to hear them all. I don't know how that works. It's up, so. Why don't we hear them all? Okay. Yeah. If that's any, any questions that I guess then on the swimming one before I go to the next one. No. All right. 
Next up, indoor track. So um, there's always been interest at Frontier, from my understanding, in having an indoor track um, team, um, but there hasn't been space at Smith College. Last year, just before the pandemic, the uh, Luke Conti, the PVIC president, reached out to me and said, hey, I know you guys have always wanted to. I, I got word that we could fit you in. So I did a survey. 81 kids uh, said yes, and you see 31 boys, 50 girls. Um, six of them play a different sport. They all come from basketball, which again, that's a cut. We usually make cuts, so we're allowing more kids to participate. Um, so we get we get that number of, if, so with the swim and winter track, we would bring the the total number of from 200, or, sorry, from 100 in winter sports to closer to 200. So almost double it just by adding those two. Uh, in terms of costs, there's six meets. They're all at Smith College, right there. Fifteen hundred dollars for those. Coaches, we basically looking at the, the line items um, in our in the contract. There is uh, line items for our ski team, Alpine Ski, but that became a co-op, so we no longer have the. Um, we're not using those line items, so basically matching up all the stuff. Like we're kind of taking that spot, and we could apply it to the winter um, track coach positions, and then all most of the equipment and uniforms can be used from cross country and spring track. So there's no immediate, like we need to buy X, Y, and Z. It's, it's pretty, I mean, I think the difference is things like a couple indoor shot puts versus an outdoor shot put and some small stuff like that. But again, no, we, the high jump pits we can use that we already have and the big stuff is covered. Um, that's what I got for indoor, indoor track. Questions on that specifically? Yeah, I got a question, Carl. Yeah. Um, I assume this is what you mean, but your first line on here, I assume, is what you're alluding to. This is for a number of years, there has been an interest, but no space at the meets, yep. Smith College. So I, I assume you mean now there is space and that's where practice and meets would be held at Smith College? So um, close. So we. it sounds like from, from talking to Marty Sanderson before, we, there's always been kids who have wanted this um, in the space at the meets means the, the practices actually don't happen at Smith College. All the meets do. The practices um, would happen before some would happen before school in the gym. Uh, distance runners would run outside when it wasn't super cold um, and sprinters and things would run on the, the third floor after school. And um, this, this was like, when I'm talking to Darius first about this. This is something he brought up that like, hey, what, how are we going to practice? So I called all the local ADs that have uh, winter track teams. I'm like, so what do you guys do? Nobody's got a track. And that's exactly what they do. They come in at weird times and use the gym or they, they run on the, the top floor to, to make it work. So Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, I, I just one other quick question this is probably really more sure. of a personal question, but since I got you here, I might as well ask it. Sure. Uh, so I have a kiddo who yep. would be really interested in this. Yeah. Um, but she's, she also downhill skis. She's not on the ski team, but she's always done ski club. Yep. It, 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 is it possible to do two things like ski one day a week? And then if it's okay with the coach, do, do track, or you really have to kind of pick one or the other? Um, it, well, that's an interesting one. If it, if it was not a, let me say this again, let me start again. If she was on the Alpine ski team, which is an MIA sport, it would, you'd have to pick one or the other. But whereas the ski club is is a club, um, you could participate in both as long as the coach is okay with it, and it, you know what I mean. It works out schedule wise, right. um, so it's an option in that sense. So, right. yeah. Okay, thank you. I got it. It was very exciting. Yeah. Other questions? Anybody about indoor track? Okay. All right. Eight. Keith and Olivia looked like had hands up. Yeah, I can't see that, so. No, I can't. Um, yeah, I think Carl already answered the questions that I had when he was talking to um, Damien, but um, so the, are the meets going to be just a day of the week, or would those be on weekends? Um, well, you know what, that's a good question. I know that, Carl. Thank, thank oh, you, Darius. So Smith College <laughs> opens up their um, the track for Friday night meets. And so what they do is they stack. So there's tons of schools. That they're like, I think there's like 12 schools. So they have these joint meets and they have, they have two time slots where they have like one starts at four to six and then they exit and then it's like 6.30 to 8.30. And then each team has a bye week. And so this, you're there. It's a multiple meet 
event and it's just controlled chaos but um yeah but, but real, realistically they, they do open it up there and it's it's only for it's friday night it's awesome that sounds great i could not be happy about this thank you Thanks, Darius. Hey, Keith. And I got less of a question, just more kind of as a support. So I coached swimming for many, many years in Amherst, and we worked in close coordination with the winter winter track team, and they made it work in like what you were describing, Carl. They spent a lot of time in the weight room. The sprinters were in the weight room. Distance, distance runners would go around. So just in terms, just because there's a track, I've seen it work really successfully. Cool. All right, next up. So unified basketball. This is one that I'm especially excited about the possibility of. Um, I didn't even really know what unified basketball was until recently. So what is it? Basically regu regular education students, which in, in unified basketball they call partners, and special ed students, which are all athletes, play together on a basketball team. Um, so this is the type of thing, a couple practices a week, one game per week, and they have a um, GM brigade at the end of the season where all the kind of local schools play. Um, one interesting thing, so the fall, which I said, there's over 300 kids. Um, my first thought when I came here, I was like, man, we should never add anything in the fall because it's already more than half of our kids. It's just going to take from other sports. Uh, but when I heard about this, it, it, it's, I think, great for lots of reasons, but it gets special ed kids another option for something to do. And those kids who are into sports, but maybe not super athletes, or maybe they get cut from a team, they can still take part in this because it wouldn't be cuts on a team like this. And then they can help and work with the special ed students. Um, so, and, and being here after being at a vocational school for a number of years, um, in some ways I forgot about, like the, I, I go down, down the hallway and I see the special ed kids and they come into our gym class and we do a joint thing with them. And I'm like, they need something. They need something for, for kids um, to get more involved. So the Special Olympics, I reached in researching this, the Special Olympics, there's a grant available for this if we start a team where they basically give us a check for $2,000 in the first year to get it started and a thousand in the second. So the third year we would have to, any of that stuff that was recurring, we'd have to pick up, but that's a huge um, amount of money for this type of thing to kind of get going. And we can use that on whatever we want, whether it's uniforms, coaches, busing, it, if they don't tell you you have to use it for a certain thing. Um, and we wouldn't charge a user fee for this um, so that we, you know, there we would need a lot of um, parent support as well. You know, some of the kids who are in special ed, they have, you know, they have some special extra needs in terms of rides home and things like that. So, you know, the parents would have to be a little more involved than a, a um, um, regular education kid playing sports. So we don't want to like burden them like, hey, you got to pay and you have to help us out kind of thing. So that's the thought process behind that. Um, and then Darius, if you can scroll up a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's good. So costs, uh, we could use our own basketball uniforms if we had to as a way, you know, to save money. Or one idea is to buy t-shirts and, you know, get the kids' names on the back so they keep them at the end of the season. Um, the coach, looking at the amount of games and practices, I, I think we would use a middle school coaching position as a guide. So somewhere around, you know, fifteen to $1,700 um busing there'd be a three away game so it's only about 750 bucks and then transportation if there are kids that have you know need the, the a special bus that's that like a ramp and things like that so that kind of stuff we have to work out details uh but i've been talking a lot with um the chickabee ad and the agawam ad who have already dealt with this and you know they're like basically you can it, it, yes there's steps to it but like the parents and the special educators and stuff will really come together to help these kids out um, and the other hurdle to get over is gym space. So we have a volleyball team, you know, three levels for that. Um, I, I, one solution would be that the unified basketball team could practice right after school. So they don't have to go home and come back. And, you know, their practices are typically only like an hour, hour and a half. So volleyball, we could kind of work with volleyball, who I'm sure would be flexible for, for something like this. Um, and Lynette Howard, who, you know, works with a lot of the special ed kids, she mentioned it to a couple parents and, and she was like, they were ecstatic with the idea of like something for their kids. Um, so those are some hurdles there. I don't think there's any, other. let's see, I look at my own paper. No, that's the end of that one. So questions for unified basketball. Carl, could we, could we use uh, like Deerfield's gym possibly with a unified team? That's a great idea. I see. I didn't even think about that. I'm still in my head block this year that they used it for storage and it wasn't available that I blocked it out, but that that's actually a great idea. Yeah. It's just yep. a, it's just a thought. I mean, yeah. 
it's tough with all the other sports, especially volleyball. It has three different sections going on. So, but that's, you know, one possibility if they're not using it. And Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Other questions? I was expecting a lot more questions. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that until I was done. All right. <laughs> Next up, we got uh, spring, spring sport boys tennis. So we've had a girls tennis program for a long time. Uh, I am lucky enough this year to be the girls tennis coach. Um, and we have a number of boys who play on the team. Um, so right now the way it works is basically they, they play together and it, it's all based on ability. So whoever beats the person above them on like a tennis ladder, they get to play. Um, so I sent out a survey, 10 students responded, seven yeses, three maybes. Um, you can see here a couple play track. Uh, others do not play a spring sport. The MIA has a number for each sport in terms of kind of the, what you should have to have a team. 10 is the number for that. So we're a little under that with the yeses, um, but it would start as a club anyways, in terms of the way it works. You know, I basically tell the PVIC, Hey, we're starting a, a boys tennis team. And then the first couple of years as a club, I reach out to schools and I say, Hey, we're starting a team. Would you play us? Would you play us? Once we've established that a couple of years, then they assign us to a league. Um, so, why is this important with such low numbers? So being the coach, what I've seen this year is boys displacing girls. Um, so we, we have one boy who is our second singles player, great kid, but there's also like the whole, you know, that's one spot a girl could be playing. Um, and not only does it affect there, but like then our third singles player who is plays behind the boy, like she's playing a couple of matches this year. She really should be our second, second singles player. Um, and she's really not getting as much out of her season because she's playing lesser competition. Um, so it's, it's something that I never would have realized, um, without coaching, but, um, you know, it's, we had, so I'll, I should also say this year when, when the families asked me if I was going to make cuts as they used to be, there were cuts in the past. Um, I said, I wasn't going to make cuts because we need kids doing as much as possible this year. And I ended up starting the year with 20, 24 girls, well, 24 kids. And it's gone down to 20 now, but like, that's a lot of people. And if it, you know, we can get those boys on the other team that makes more spots for those girls to play. So, um, I just think it's something that we, we need to do. So, uh, oh, and then costs various, if you scroll up a little bit more. So coach, uh, about 25 bucks, uniforms, polo shirts, they're, you know, uh, somewhere in the $300 range for all of them, not each. And then general supplies, the girls' tennis budget's three fifty. So you know we worked it, it worked out fine this year with that buying the stuff I needed for the girls' team. So I would suggest that be about the same. Uh, no busing. We use the small white bus. If we have a boys and a girls' team, we play one home and one's away. So there's not a conflict with the bus. Um, and there's no officials to pay we put in there. But um, I actually thought that would be a huge problem coaching tennis. That kids have to make their own calls. It actually is pretty good. It worked out pretty well. So that's boys tennis. Questions anyone has? All right, I'm really crushing it here, huh? You got <laughs> all right. I was going to ask about the viability of the tennis courts because I know that's an yes. ongoing subject, but you yep. know, let's just put them in there and see what happens. Yeah. So, well, one of the things that I would I would say is uh, this year. I reached out to DA about using their courts and it didn't work out timing wise because of COVID and their kids still being there, but they were open to the idea of us using them in the future. Um, so, you know, I know the courts are not, there's only four of them right now. So, and they're not in the best they They need some attention soon, but um, when they are, when they do get fixed, you know, we can stagger practices too. So girls practice like right after school, maybe they overlap a little bit and then, you know, so they're not here all night. You know, DA, I think, is an option after talking to the um, the athletic director about that because they have a ton of courts over there. Wow. You Actually, you bring up a good point, Judy, just as school committee members. So our tennis tracks are, we did patch them. The patches were supposed to last mm -hmm. five years. We're on year seven of them. And, you know, we're looking at a quarter of a million dollar project. And so, you know, I think, you know, increasing use of those 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 tennis courts might be also in our, in our something we want to do if we're going to be investing that kind of money into that refurbish. Um, it's one of those things where we kind of held on, held on, held on. And we walked out there this after two seasons of um, 
you know, the, of water getting in the cracks and the and freezing and that kind of stuff, it's going to be a major overhaul. So that's coming down the track. So I'm coming down the track. No, it's coming down the tennis court. Um, <laughs> so it'll be coming another one of those big, big, big expenses for facilities. I would ask the same thing about um, Carl, just to go back to swimming, like pool time is very competitive. Uh, as I'm with Keith, I've been a lifelong swimmer and I have been kicked out of more pools for more teams than I care to um, think about. And it's, it's kind of a drag. So um, the addition of the co-op league is in charge of managing access to pools and pool times and meet schedules and all that other stuff. Like they have control over whatever that we don't have to, we're not part yeah. of that. But basically, okay. like our job with this is we get kids to sign up. We have a meeting with the Turner's coach and everything. I make sure all of our kids are eligible and then they go there and their, their coach and their AD kind of handle the, the setup of all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, G Carl, Judy said the term co-op league. It's not. Oh, basically, yeah. we're, oh, joining, we're joining Turner's, Turner's team as members of their team. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, that was not there. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yes, it just said co-op swimming. I guess I, I took a leap there with that one. So right, we currently do co-op with hockey yeah, yeah. as well. We join Greenfield's yep. team. Yeah, so our kids will have Turner's Falls uniforms on when they're swimming or swim caps. Unless you want to put a pool in, then we can have our own team. <laughs> <laughs> UMass already we... took away one pool, but I would take a pool. There were supposed to be one in Sunderland. Well, I put it put it above the tennis courts. Mm -hmm. Sports uh, complex. Yeah. All right. This is how this is how we'll pay for it. <laughs> I don't think it's going to cover it. All right. So the last area to talk about is user fees for athletics. So currently, we charge a hundred for the first sport, eighty for the second, seventy for the third. Uh, in talking to Darius, I found out we haven't raised the price in approximately thirteen years. Uh, I just started thinking about all oh, what things used to cost 15 years ago and what they cost now. And um, I know this isn't necessarily always a popular idea, but I, I suggest making the fee 125 for all sports. Uh, Co-ops are different. That's set by the host school. Um, and I have a list of some of I picked schools that were similar to us athletically a little bit more than, you know, like in Franklin County. I don't think we should compare like what Turner's Falls charges. They were a very different animal than us. Um, so I, I listed some, a lot of them do like charge extra for, you know, football or depending on what the sport is. Um, so I just kind of give you a, try to give you a little sampling up there of other schools. And then, um, so he scares and scroll through that. And then the youth at the bottom here, the user fee waiver. Um, so one thing we're never going to turn a kid away if they can't pay. I want to be clear about that. Um, and, and this is to offset the cost where you are certainly not taking in enough money to pay for everything. I don't think that's that's what we should do as a school. We're, you know, we're trying to just defer the cost so we can offer more things. Um, so they can, uh, people can apply for a waiver and they're awarded based on need. Um, we have recently set up a new online payment system and we have an online waiver system. So it's accessible to anyone. They, can, they don't have to come in anymore physically to get a piece of paper. It can be, all be done online. Um, I, they could do it on paper if they had to, but, but um, they don't have to. And we'll continue with that process. And again, nobody's going to be turned away, even with this increase, or because if they can't pay. Carl, do, do we have to worry with anything that we're doing tonight with the deleting of uh, middle school football and adding this and adding that Title Nine or at all? So I did. Uh, that was a, that's a great question. I, I made a list um, when I started looking at all this stuff, and uh, it actually, if all of these things are approved. So some of them, like practice boys and girls, uh, boys tennis will make, will, you know, mirror girls tennis now. So it basically comes out to, uh, I should write the number down. Sorry, give me one sec. 13 and 13 for boys, 13. Boys. So. I, I thought I would ask that question. I just. Yeah. That I, is a great want, question. I don't want boys to get mad at us or girls to get mad at us or yeah. anything like that. And, I mean, I look at what you put together for for a presentation tonight, and it's it's really good. I thank you. Know, I, I appreciate what you did, and I mean, it really lays it out and how it is and stuff. But I still like to get fishing as one of these opportunity sports, <laughs> and girls girls can fish just like boys. So, 
<laughs> and Olivia has her hand up, so. So I just have a question about the user fee thing, and I am all for rising with inflation for sure. Um, but is there a reason, was it just simplicity that we went to 125 across the board as opposed to having like second and third sport only because as like, I was just thinking like, oh, what would this be? Like, I knew that, you know, with two kids playing the sports, like thinking about having it be less each time um, was helpful, not that we actually have to do that, but, um, and how come other schools have so much more for football? Is it because those programs take a lot more money or I was just noticing that the list has a lot of schools having football being more, and I understand we're not trying to like completely defray costs, but I mean, so, that takes a lot more money to play football. Yep. So the, first, the football question is, is a relatively good one. The, the amount of equipment, for that is is super expensive. Um, like a helmet costs, you know, three hundred plus dollars. Um, so I think that's one of the things it costs so much. Um, and then the first question, well, in terms of the one twenty five across the board. So you know, in talking with Darius about this a lot, like in the simple one of the simple things is it's really kind of crazy trying to keep track of who has what and who doesn't in terms of first sport, second sport. Uh, but even more so, it's like, um, I don't know, years ago, if, you, if people remember this, they raised the price on the inspections for your car. And they're like, oh, we should do it 40, we should do it 30. And then they like just came to the middle instead. So it's, we could charge more and then less as the seasons go, but like we're charging a little bit more, but for everything. And then it's way less kind of keeping track of things and, um, people are still paying more but and you know there are some schools we could um put in a limit for a family i guess too that that's something that a, a few schools do which i didn't put here because i thought yeah. i figured like, this is to me this is a like you said cost of inflation i mean inflation raise not not like uh we're trying to you know put it to 200 dollars and get things paid. oh absolutely yeah. absolutely i was just thinking you know even with yep. you know one graduated so i've only got one and i was like oh great because there'll only be one to pay these <laughs> But then I'm thinking, and I don't need to throw them under the, like a big family, you know, like the Browns or whatever, you know, if they've got, you know, four kids playing, you know, I, I think a family yes. cat think good thing to think about. But I'm, I'm, I definitely think we need to keep up with the times in terms of price for sure. Perfect. Lynn, you had your hand up. Lynn first and Keith second. Yeah, I guess I'm just kind of wondering, since we haven't raised the price in 13 years, what are our athletes missing? by having such a low user fee and what will they be gaining by increasing it? So right now what's happening is that the school is paying the difference. So, you know, athletics is an expensive line item in our school. It's also expensive because of the success of our athletics. We don't usually talk about that often, but um, we use the revolving account to help offset when your, when your children's teams make all the tournaments that they do. There are some schools that send their, have to send a bus or one or two to tournament. We've had years where every team has made tournament in the fall and gone far in tournament. It's very expensive. So there's the amount of money that comes in helps offset the cost of the school. So from, you know, whatever you can pick, whatever we're buying with it from salaries to equipment um, to transportation, we just we, we shuffle that around based on the need of that season. Any idea what kind of numbers are going to be looking at? Like how much is how much is going to be raised by the increase? Uh, so I, I can give you an example. Darius and I were talking today about like what we're asking for here. Basically, total kind of number wise with this presentation is around fifteen thousand dollars. And if we use the number for what, it, like basically half of it would be paid for with that new user fee amount you know as so it's you know it, again we're just trying to pay to defer the cost a little bit um i guess um, maybe, maybe darius can answer that better i feel like i didn't do a great job <laughs> i think it may be you may have been answering a different question there's yeah. one question is that the new sport proposals will cost an estimated around fifteen thousand dollars about nine thousand of that will be picked up through user new user fees that's minus a percentage. Um, that's minus twenty percent of those maybe um, who are on scholarship um, or um, or wave wave fees, 
and minus the special education, the um, special Olympics um, grant, so to speak. Um, but the question I think Lynn may have been asking was how much more money do you plan on generating compared to previous years? Was that what you're asking? I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, if you give me a minute, I could do a little bit of math on it. The problem is that it's an escalator. So you can yeah. guess that based out of just at a fall sports alone, 300 times 25 minus whoever was on scholarship or you know, waived fees rather. But then we don't know. This is where we get into a lot of complications when it starts sports, you know, finish the sport and that kind of stuff. Does that count as a season? Some of that other kind of crazy accounting stuff. But how many kids are winter sport second season or winter sport first season, then spring sport second season or third season, each one on a tiered thing. So estimating that ahead, you know, we could have done that math. Carl's a licensed math teacher. I think he'll be able to, to figure this out for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George pipes in. Nice, George. Uh, it's just middle school math, so this is a little advanced for me. <laughs> Keith, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I got a – well, just to, to add on maybe to, to Lynn's point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Darius, Carl, uh, ask, uh, I think this is maybe where you're going with it. I got a couple points after this, but um, your coaches' salaries are for the season only, so anytime they make postseason, that, that's additional pay? No, there's no additional. Oh, that's interesting. They work, they work for free. Yeah. That, that'll be a different meeting when I ask for a little bit more because they're basically working long, longer. longer. <laughs> I think there's that's a contract. You have to pay for those months. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off. Can you say that again? But you still have to pay for the cost of the travel and the participation. Yes. Right. I mean, I mean the only reason that, that, that brings up because whenever we made there, – there's certain sports – that you have to qualify for postseason, other ones that kids that kind of make it automatically. For for us, it was my salary was always regular season, but we made postseason every year, and then they would have to come up with additional funds for transportation, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I just have a couple of points. One, uh, Bob, I appreciate you bringing up the question about Title IX because I think that's really important, and it's good to hear that that provides some equity. Um, the second thing is uh, Amherst did a study a few years ago where we talked about raising athletic fees. And what we found was um, every time we raised athletic fees, there was zero drop in participation. So we basically found that we could raise them to whatever we wanted. The participation would remain the same. And I appreciate you looking at the surrounding communities and taking a very measured approach and raising them, not just going to up to whatever you wanted to really trying to make it equitable to the surrounding communities. And then the third thing is many years ago, I was coaching in Boston and uh, our, our school instituted a girls wrestling program. And I remember talking to the athletic director, I'm like, a girls wrestling program? And he was very pointed. He said, my job is to provide as many opportunities for kids to participate as possible. And that has always stuck with me. So I really appreciate you trying to expand the opportunities for kids, especially in the winter. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Uh, one, else? Can I add one thing there that Keith made me think of? In terms of postseason two, we're, we're about to change to the statewide tournament for the MIA. So all those uh, Western Mass tournament games now, they might not just be down the street. We, you know, we might because it's going to be a across the whole state, not just in our section at first. So our, we could have a first round game that's all the way, you know, in the eastern part of the state, which would have been only in the in a state championship, maybe. But but so like now that could be for all the first round games even. So those bus costs for that are certainly have the opportunity to be much more money so wow yeah it won't be grip go busking probably it'll be a um, hired bus correct yeah it de i think it, it depends on the thing but yeah i don't i don't know anybody else have any questions for carl if not i would like to get a motion on his proposal Not everybody jump in at once. I move to accept Carl's proposal for expanding winter sports. Thank you. The expanding, expanding the sports schedule. And who second it? Second. Thanks, Bill. Any other questions? Judy? Uh, I always have to check to, if my mic is on. I just want to make sure we are, the vote was the athletic and user fee schedule. But to clarify, it is the it is the changes to the athletic offerings and the change to the athletic fee schedule. I just want to make sure we're all in the same boat or the same page vote wise. 
I would say yes, Judy. Yeah, good. Okay, Bob Halla? Yes. Lynn Roberts? Yes. Uh, I think Phil left, correct? Yeah, Phil had another meeting. That's what I thought. Okay, uh, Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Go swimming. Uh, Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Carl. Great presentation. Don't Thank forget, don't forget Mary, Judy. She's in there somewhere. Who? Mary. Mary. She's here. Mary came in? Yep. Where? I'm here. Uh, oh, there you are. Hi, Mary. I'm sorry. Would you like to vote on that? I just skipped right over you, and Bill checked me. Mary, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Bill. Appreciate it. No problem. Us old timers have to stick together. <laughs> I only have one screen, so it's minutes or you guys. So I make some choices along the way. All right, kids. <laughs> Thank you, Darius. You got an update on the track? I do. Um, I do want to say you know, again. You guys just said it, but thank you to Carl. I mean, to do that many initiatives at once. That's what happens when you slow down an athletic director with COVID last spring. He starts thinking. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, just apprentice. He could have done that slowly over time, and we could have. Um, I gotta find my. Uh, here, let me show you the update on the track. I'll just do it through pictures, so it'll take even quicker. Track work has started. Um, oh, first of all, the tree you guys voted last week for um, our staff, our retired staff who have passed away. Thank you, Bonnie Harrison, but that was put in two days ago. Nice little tree in the corner there. Looks nice. Good. There you go. We got to work on the grass next, but we'll get there. Oh, we had a tent there. That's what killed all the grass. Um, they started work on Monday. So there, there's your track. They've ripped it apart. Um, there's a big pile of it. I went on this right before the meeting tonight. And there's the, the surface underneath the track. This is, there's several, the first turn is not terrible where the shade is, but it's like this, the whole stretchway in front of um, the visitor's area. So I just wanted to kind of show people who were concerned that, you know, we weren't, you know, the, the surface underneath the track wasn't that bad. You know, you guys don't need to be doing this. Um, we removed the frosting for the top of that track. And um, there it is. And yeah, so there's your track update. Isn't it nice with pictures? Kind of, can you see it? You're welcome to go out there and take a look at it when they're not working. But they did that in the hottest of those days. That's the one thing I did feel guilty that we had a half day schedule and they were removing asphalt or whatever it was in the same heat. I'm like, whoa. All right. Anyway. Um, yeah, that's the track update. Oh no, that's not it at all. Yeah, we oh, need yeah, a vote. That's what yeah. the work is. They <laughs> show. Oh, this is what happens when I do double meetings. So we have a we have a, an issue where the track is there's work on the track going on, and there's going to be change orders. Okay, for example, there's that um, large tree that's next to the visitor stand. We had to hire an arborist to come out and examine that tree to see if it's going to needs to come down. It's a beautiful, you know, seven year old tree. And we didn't want to just cut it down. So we paid to have an arborist. But I have to get approval because we're now it, it's increased. That was $500. I went ahead and did it. Um, but it, we really should have a subcommittee that has the authorization this summer to do change orders. Um, and we can do it up to like twenty five dollars to $50,000 or something of that sort to be able to handle if there is any changes, if they run into any problems. Um, Rather than pulling the full school committee in to do that, you could vote to do it that way. Um, but you know, the next thing is going to come back. Do we want to pay an arborist to cable the top and prune the tree? You know, that's going to be like three thousand dollars. And so, but those are things that have to be, you know, per, you know, decided. And whether or not we go to the full committee for it, or just create a subcommittee to oversee that process over the next two months of the summer, because that's when all the summer work is going to be taking place. So that's what I'm asking for you to assign a subcommittee to approve change orders. Um, maybe a group of three of you is kind of what I was thinking, but I'm making it up as I, on the fly here, there's no set kind of thing here, but it will be a three of you that can meet, you know, can come on site, make decisions. And I would suggest you put a cap on it, um, that whatever cap you feel comfortable, the Bob Decker cap, 
you always put a cap on everything. Um, <laughs> you know, but you know what I'm saying? But something like that for efficiency to do this project through. That's my suggestion. You could hold meetings during the summer to come in with change orders. I'll, I'll volunteer my services. I'll do it, Bob. I can do it too. I have, I have a lot of time off this summer. There's there's three there's three of us. Is that enough? I just need someone to make it. I just need someone to give me approval. I don't I don't care if it's one. Hey, I'm thinking like three, three upset that four guys that want to do it, just do it. So we have to somebody have to nominate the three of us or or Keith? You like, actually Bob is chair appoint the subcommittee. Okay. Keith, you have a question? I'll let you a point. You want to be on the committee? I would love to, but I'm not going to be here. Okay. I'll guess, I'm going to I'm going to point Damian, Bill, and myself on the subcommittee for on the uh, track updates and overages and stuff. Are we putting a cap on this? About uh, on, like the, on the value of the change orders, like as the Bob Decker. We'll call it the Decker rule. How much does the boat cost, Bob? <laughs> how much is how much does the boat cost? Yeah. Uh, the one I want, twelve five. There you go. Cap of fifteen. Fifteen thousand. Yep. Does somebody have to say that you're going to need a bigger boat? <laughs> I don't want. I don't want a bigger boat. I, I don't want a bigger boat. Thank you for I laughing, Kitty. I don't want to buy a bigger vehicle to tow a bigger boat. All kidding aside, I think as construction costs go fifteen thousand is chump change. So uh, yeah. we, ought to, we ought to make it a little higher than that. I guess that was my question, Bill. Are you saying fifteen thousand per one or fifteen thousand total? Or well, fifty thousand per with a fifty thousand dollar total? Per, it's got to be whatever the number is. I think it has to be per change order because they're liable to pop up. You got to deal with each one as they come because they, that, that, I'm sure they're going to have some bearing on the chronology of this operation. So you can't really wait. You know, when something comes up, you got to deal right. with it. So, right. Why don't we put a cap on $50,000? For a combined on, order or singles? Total. And so 15000 for individual orders and $50,000 total? Yeah, and then if it's more than that, then we'll have to. I would I would just do the do the fifty thousand max because yeah. the change orders are coming from the same company. So if we had that problem, they could just. I'm just being honest. They'll just cook the books and split it into two, and then you vote it. You know what I mean? Yeah. In order to so that you get the efficiency. So as long as the committee's fine with Shelly laugh, they use the word "cook the books." Um, <laughs> but the uh, she hates when I use that. Um, but the. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? As long as the committee feels like that, over fifty thousand dollars, the full committee needs to come back to discuss because now we're starting to talk about numbers that are larger than you authorized, right? You agree, Keith? You're looking in thought. I just sent you a text, Darius, to answer a question before I ask it. <laughs> Texting me. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a subcommittee thing. Okay. Should I say anything? Because nope. it may make Damien really happy. Yeah, Is no, the, oh, I, let's leave it until we get those numbers. Okay. Sorry, Damien, I can't tell you. Ah, oh, come on. I have to Fair cut you Damien, arm. what about us? <laughs> well, everybody. <laughs> so, do we have a, do you have to vote on this for the three of us? I the, think it's an appointment. We're just talking about the change orders. Okay, just appoint. I just have to appoint. We have to vote on it. You have to vote <laughs> to create the subcommittee, and then you appoint the subcommittee. So your committee has to agree that you're creating a subcommittee to oversee change orders with a cap of fifty thousand dollars for the track. You got that, Judy? Yeah. Yeah. Someone first and second that, and then. And then you appoint the committee after you already did, but okay. I'll move what he said. So I will second it since I wrote it down. I'll let you do a roll call. Um, yeah, Bob? Yeah. Yes. Lynn? 
Yep. Uh, Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. And Phil Smith? Phil? Yeah. Okay. Damien, I got to get your cell phone number sometime. Thanks. Okay. I'll, uh, I think I have your email. I'll, I'll email it to you. So you. I'll be in touch immediately on that because I do have the, we have a tree. We have to decide if we're going to prune the tree for two grand or so, three grand. And you said something about cabling it also maybe? Yeah. That's another option too. That's I have the report and I'll share that with everybody. Okay. <clears throat> and everybody's been appointed and we don't have to go any further on that. Great. Okay. Um, We'll go on to transportation reimbursement, the vote. Okay. Is this a, is this a Shelley? It's a Shelley. That's me. Um, I don't know, Darius, if you want to show that last page of my report again, because I don't remember the numbers. I do remember that we budgeted 199,000 and change. I think it's one, 199, 112, I think. Um, so what happens with transportation reimbursement is when we do the budget, in uh you know winter months january february the governor comes out with his preliminary budget i believe it, he has to legally do that by the end of january but it's not gone through the full budget process so the house hasn't voted and nothing's finalized so we tend to typically historically from what i can see go with the governor's amount or in some years even slightly less um, than that a percentage, say 75% of the governor's budget. Well, last year, uh, this came up and it's coming up again this year where the house has approved a higher reimbursement amount. So when that happens, it automatically increases our cash on hand and impacts our e and So in this year in particular, we're looking at almost $210,000 in cash, higher than what we budgeted to offset our assessment. So if our um, maximum E&D is 500,000, 200 of it right here is in reimbursement from transportation from the state. So it really puts us in a spot where we have to find something to do with this money. It's great that we're getting higher reimbursement than what we're budgeting, um, but we can't just let that sit there or else it's gonna impact you know, our certification and other cash that we might be counting towards our E&D already. So, the school set up a transportation revolving fund many years ago. Um, there's never been money put into it. I talked to the auditor about it this week, but you have already voted on the account. It's sitting there. Um, because we have a budget already set for 22, we could put any excess funds into the revolving fund to be used in fiscal year 23. The way that the law is written around this is that you have to use it in the year following that you vote. Um, but the auditor did clarify that because 22 budgets already set, you use it for the next year um, that you'd be going into your budget season. So we would have at that point for 23, we would have this funds available either to reduce our overall budget or apply it directly to the assessment. Six and one half dozen and another doesn't matter. It's going to reduce the amount that the town has to pay. Um, and then at that point, assuming the state's still reimbursing for regional transportation, we would have our regular annual reimbursement on top of it. So Darius and I are recommending that school committee votes to put any funds over the budgeted amount uh, for this year into the transportation revolving fund for use in fiscal year 23. So moved. Can you hold on? Shelly, can you just repeat the end of that? Recommend that any funds over that a budgeted amount be placed into the transportation revolving fund for use in fiscal year 23. And Bill, did the first yep. one? So moved. I'll second it. Uh, Bob, I'll do roll yeah. call. Bob, yeah? Yes. Lynn? Yeah. Olivia? Yes. Judy? Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Uh, Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Bill? Yep. Thank you.
Okay, summer reading book for a school committee anti-racism racism work. So, Bob, on this, Olivia um, had brought this up at a previous meeting, and then um, in between meetings, um, her and I, you know, communicated via, um, via email about doing a summer reading book for the school committee on anti-racism. You know, we did receive um, our anti-racism work, rather. You know, you did hear public comments tonight about other avenues as well. Um, what I had proposed, you know, I talked with my administrative team about what good books are out there for, um, you know, for our, our committee and such. What I came up with was a, um, where did I go here? Uh, is that you want to talk about race? Um, this was a, a, an option that we put out there. You know, you also heard tonight about other options to work on this summer. So you kind of have some different options out there. Olivia, do you want to kind of jump in you? This is some of your, this is some of your work here too. And so I don't want to take away from <laughs> your. Um, no, 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 not at all. But I did just want to um, start off by saying that um, uh, just about what Jen Jennifer Smith had said um, earlier and that, you know, what she put together was amazing. Um, you know, we had talked about this before we had heard from you and Lou and Emily. Um, and so we already had kind of what we wanted to do first off um, in motion, but I don't feel, and I'm only speaking as myself, I, you know, the other um, community members can chime in, but I'm not feeling like this is a one and done thing by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I really appreciate the um, time and effort that went into the um, professional development curriculum that you created um, and that, I have actually, you know, the whole, there was a whole part on um, what is a Karen, I didn't go in order, but the what is a Karen and um, cultural appropriation and, you know, kind of um, white saviorism, you know, in media and that kind of stuff was really helpful to me as I was looking through them um, recently. Um, but that we had spoken, um, Darius and I had spoken about um, adding to what, you know, Keith had made a great suggestion about taking one of the books from um, the frontier list that all of our children are going to be reading um, especially one that is, um, you know, people of color and, um, and being able to read that. So it's, it's what they're also reading, but then, you know, um, reading the, so you want to talk about race. Um, Ijama Aluvo is awesome. Um, I've used her before with my staff at the church. We've used this book. Um, and I was glad that he brought it up because I really thought that it was a great place for us to start, um, for the summer. So, um, she just wrote another book too called Mediocre, which I just ordered. It's supposed to be really amazing, um, but I won't get ahead of myself with that. <laughs> um, so that's just what we had been thinking. Um, and because it was a slight change in what we had talked about at our last meeting about um, just reading one of the frontier um, reading list, we wanted to bring that up as well. And where people were on you know, board, we had talked about making sure that um, this first step that we're doing, that we are gonna meet before our first meeting for um, a little bit of time off camera so that we can really authentically be ourselves and talk about, um, you know, where this affected us and what we got from it. Um, and also, you know, I was looking through some of the um, questions that Jen had, Jennifer Smith had put in um, on different work, you know, um, things that she had done. And I think those are good jumping off questions too. Although the book is phrased in kind of like a question and answer kind of way. Um, so that's what I had. Could I just jump in and, and add as you're thinking about um, whatever it is you want to do? First of all, Jen is fine. <laughs> um, and it, it might be another option in addition to this uh, book reading that if you all decide to do that as, as the frontier um, professional development for your school committee, the Deerfield Elementary School Committee um, is interested in utilizing the Deerfield Inclusion Group and Lou's offer to um, meet in a group twice in the summer, like a mid-July, mid-August. And I think it would be really easy to have other school committee members jump into that same group. Um, so that could be something if, if people are interested in doing that as well. And we talked about sort of breaking up the pathways of identity and white privilege into two um, groups like you listen and read through the first five lessons and then meet and discuss and then do the second five and meet a month later. So just another right. option. Yeah. So what you're saying, Jen, just is so you're so unclear in case, you know, 
is that we would be invited to be able to be a part of what is already going to be happening with Deerfield or you, or you mean a different set of meetings? No, I think joining the same, okay. joining that group would be great. Yeah. Can I ask where are the rest of the subcommittee, where are the rest of the school committees on this topic? I mean, uh, Sunderland, Waitley, Hatfield, is this like a committee wide endeavor or has it been like, have they taken it? How far have the other groups taken it? Everybody's at the same spot. They are. Everybody's talking about bringing on, um, doing something. Um, it's on the agenda. Well, now it's, Actually, Cumberland met last night and did not discuss it because they didn't receive Lou's letter until after five. Um, so, um, so they haven't set up anything for summer professional development. Frontier, you guys were have been talking about it for a little while. Deerfield talked about it at the last meeting. I have Wheatley on Thursday, so they'll be talking about it. And I got Conway on Monday or Tuesday next week. Um, so they'll be talking about it as well. So it hasn't been a coordinated effort all into one, it's probably been easier to do it that way, but there's been different conversations from different committees. I haven't, I haven't created a professional development plan for school committee. I kind of feel awkward. <laughs> like I think school committee should create the professional development plan okay. and we should kind of offer ideas to it. And you guys should go a direction you want to go. And so. frankly, I've only presented to Deerfield and Frontier because that's sort of my home base, but I'm, the pathways are open to everyone and anyone and if Deerfield picks two dates and they start working towards it, Conway, Waitley, Sunderland, and you all are certainly welcome. I think that would be great to the more the merrier, really, the better that for our towns. Yeah. And would you would it be you who would be able to like get us that what's all the committees or they does Deerfield decides you'll get us those dates so we can and what we need to do to prep for that? Yeah, I think they're they're putting out a survey to pick dates. Um and then that could certainly be shared. Okay. Missy, you have a question? Yeah, I guess a question, comment, but um, really I, as it's been a few months since I, since you sent us that, um, so I had to go back cause I did some, uh, but it's, I've been distracted with a lot of other projects. So I had to go back um, a little bit to kind of refresh where things were, but it, as, as I did them a few months ago and I didn't do all of them, uh, but it reminded me a lot of some of the conversations we had with Dig because we did a, a book reading group with this book. Um, so you want to talk about race and a lot of those conversations really kind of touched on some of the things that were in that professional development that you shared. So I I think it would be great to, to expand beyond the book with those kind of meetings. I, I would be more than happy to join that. Thanks, Missy. Judy? Yeah, I, I think I would just echo what Missy said. I think that, um, you know, to, to do it in silos sort of misses the point. I think one of the benefits of this work is that it has been district wide and we do represent all the districts. And I think it would be interesting to hear from other voices that, I mean, like clearly I live in Sunderland. I don't even know what the Sunderland School Committee did last night. Um, and that's not great, but it's a fact. Um, so, you know, I also, I mean, I think I agree, like, I, you know, I've talked about doing this for a while too. And, you know, I'm sure like anybody, it's a little half-hearted at first. It's not, you're just like thinking about the time commitment and you're mapping it out in your brain. And then you're like, all right, let's just jump right into it. Let's just start, let's, let's get on the train. And so, you know, I'd love to do it with a group. I'm sure not everybody would. It's obviously uncomfortable and difficult and challenging to address your own, um, your own questions and thoughts about identity and what's happening in your own community and with your own home. So like, I'm on board. So Jennifer, maybe we'll be seeing each other this summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we get a vote, let's vote. So Thanks, um, and in terms of, it's been a long time since I've been a teacher. Like, I don't know if everyone wants to get this book on their own or, I mean, I ordered, um, ordered it a while ago for my staff. It was, eight dollars and fifty cents at walmart um and i got it for a bunch of people you know if people need getting that i'd be happy to get some copies or whatever but also because dig did this reading group a couple of years ago i do know that the library has several copies on hand awesome <laughs> so there, there should be plenty of ways to get this even without a cost perfect thanks 
I, I, I could just uh, raise a question too. I mean, obviously reading a book and something we do on our own time is, is pretty straightforward and simple to, to do. It's doing something more that's like a curriculum that, that all, all of us as a school committee are going to try to uh, attempt to do or whatever, whether it's with DIG or whoever. Uh, I mean, you know, all of us have lives too. And I think this is a great, you know, a, you know, this is admirable. We're going to try to do this, but as we all go on vacation, we all have work schedules. We all have different various things to do. Is, is it, I mean, I, I, we, can we require ourselves to do this? I mean, I guess what's the, what's the penalty if we can't make these meetings or, or whatnot? Um, and I'm not right. saying I'm going to try to miss them. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm my job in particular. I don't work at home and I'm all right. over the country. So, well, what I'm hearing from everyone and absolutely stop me if I'm not hearing this correctly is that um, as we had talked about earlier, that we had committed to, you know, reading this book and coming together um, as us and that there are people and whomever can and who when, when we get the dates and if we're able to try and work our best to make that happen, to be able to be a part of what's um, the, the meetings that are going to be there. Great. But I, um, I don't know that it was a, that we can require that of our members. I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Olivia, actually, I am a little confused because um, the Deerfield elementary group, uh, school committee is not reading a book. Okay, right. so they they are going through the curriculum modules that the teachers were, were that Jen Smith helped create and that right. the teachers right. went through this year, right. um, and then having a meeting. So right. if we're going to join that meeting, we being this group are going to join that meeting um, for a reading kind of thing. We're doing a different, we're following kind of a different curriculum. You know what I mean? So are we looking at joining? those modules and then joining that group? Are we reading and doing the modules and joining that group? Or are we doing our own group? When I, I say thought, we have any friends here. Yeah, in my mind, which I may not communicate, <laughs> right? Um, is In my mind, what's happening is that we are, we had talked about already doing some reading ourselves and, you know, then meeting and discussing it ourselves. And then um, Jennifer presented what's going to be happening at Deerfield, and there was some interest from people to join that and make that part of their um, commitment because they might be available on those days. And that would be something that they would do separately. That wouldn't be something that we all as a frontier school committee are saying we all have to go do that. Um, but some of us may be able to, to make those commitments and want to make that happen. That's just what I understood. But again, <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong. I thought that what we were um, talking about specifically for us was the book. Um, so you think, uh, so you want to talk about like, not so you think you can dance, but um, which is specifically for us. I mean, not that they can't read it or, or do it <laughs> or join us, but you know, that, that that's what we wanted to do um, and, and get together and discuss before our first meeting. I think it's a good start with reading the book. I can't hear you both. You know, I, I'm all for reading the book, and and I can't tell you the last time I picked up a book and read it, but you know, this one looks looks like one I would love to read. So, my personal opinion. And can I? Yeah. Can I ask the facilit the book discussion? Is that an internal book discussion? Is it a facilitated book discussion? That's question one. And then the second one is <clears throat> that's the direction that the committee is taking. Can we also be included in the Deerfield one to either opt in or opt out at our own discretion to work with um, the Deerfield inclusion group if we want to take the work a little, if we want to do some additional work in addition to the book reading? Olivia, you're frozen. Oh, there you are. I think Olivia's having audio problems for hearing. I can say, it's Judy. I will send out once once the Deerfield Elementary School Committee chooses their dates. I will send it to everyone, and you are welcome to join. I'll just, even though I'm not facilitating it necessarily, I'm saying you're welcome to join those groups. And I'll yeah. tell you, Damian, um, even as traveling, the the pathway is super easy to follow and can be looked at. They're like 
um, clips of videos or podcasts you can listen to in short amounts. So it can happen whenever, wherever, in little bits or longer periods. If you have a half hour, do a little bit more, or if you have 15 minutes. Um, so it's pretty workable and flexible and not, not too scary to get into. <laughs> and then <laughs> that's that, helpful to know. I, I envisioned, yeah. I envisioned it was a in-person group and I know that's difficult for probably many of us. I mean, I know even Keith is not here all yeah. summer long. And it's, I mean, that's what the teachers did, but no, we're talking about you go through a bunch of it yourself and then just meet okay. to talk about whatever whatever it brought up for you and whatever um, you were thinking as you did it. Okay. So that's, that's from those kids know. Know. Yeah. Judy, you have your hand up still? Do you have another question? No? No. Take my hand down. I can just leave it up. Bob. Maybe I just want to. You can leave it up. I don't care. I know. Does anybody else have any questions? If not, um, we don't have to vote on a reading book, do we, Darius? Keith's hands up. Hi, Keith, where are you? Sorry. Right. No, I was just going to say there's a lot of people in a lot of different stages. There's going to be people. I think just making the recommendation that this book is something that we should read, it would open people's minds. I think whether you can read it or not, I, I mean, there are people here who are members of multiple committees. There's a time press on everybody work, but, but I, if, if, if everybody agrees that they want to at least start with the book, I think that'd be a great place. If, if there are people who would like to take the extra step to join the Deerfield committee, I think they should be open to that, but just simply reading a book and, and opening people's minds in it. And I, I honestly feel like the idea that like, this is painful work and, you know, looking at, I actually think this is very interesting work. It's enlightening. I, I think it's really, it's, it's positive work. So just, I, I would just recommend reading the book as a first step, really simple. Thanks, Keith. Are we all set? Okay, how about a update on face covering policy, Darius? So did you kind of just leave it there that you're all reading the book? I think I see Missy raising her hand. I think she's going to ask that question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was not really clear kind of where the consensus landed, but kind of everybody wants to do their own thing. And then I'm not sure kind of how we're holding ourselves accountable for being a part of this work. But, you know, we just kind of toss out, read a book if you want to read a book or go to a meeting if you want to do a meeting. I'm not clear how we're kind of committing to do this this work and how that would be seen in the eyes of the community with with committing to do this kind of work. Yeah, I, I would feel, sorry, I had to turn the camera off so I could get everyone's words because my Wi-Fi wasn't supporting both of them, but um, I, I, I feel like I would like to ask, and of course, you know, can't compel, um, I would like to ask us to um, commit to read um, or attempt, you know, to pick up the book. Um, the So You Want to Talk About Race um, and have us be able to have some discussion about that before our first meeting as we had talked about in our last meeting. And um, if people are able to do the work with Jennifer, you know, Jennifer's group, that's wonderful. And and I, I am going to try to do that and, you know, whoever can, but I do, would like us to make some sort of like going forward commitment. That <clears throat> Missy, you had your hand up. Do you still want to, you want to say something else, Missy or Lynn? I just didn't lower it, but I, does, does that sound like a reasonable plan that we are all committing to reading the book and having a discussion about it before I, I don't know if we had a meeting set in place, but before a meeting and that if you want to go above and beyond, then you're also invited to these meetings to do the pathway or you can do them on your own. Can we just I would like to and get this organized so we can move on. Or I can send a Google form and people can sign up for a couple of dates to talk about this. Talk about the book, I mean. Well, I think our dates, 
there are already school committee dates that are put in place on the calendar, if I'm not correct, for next year? Yep, we have a school committee calendar yeah. already. And, and we had talked about that we didn't want to um, have people, you know, have to show, you know, commit to something that they hadn't already committed their time and place to. And so that we would talk about it before that meeting. Is that something that we're all still on the same page about? Yes. What we could do, I suggest, is that the next school committee meeting in September to do a half hour, 45 minutes prior, by 45 minutes prior, you could have a non-public meeting. I'll find out the, the legal aspects of how you can do it for professional development to re talk about the book and do some maybe some questions and reflections of that prior to that meeting. I don't know if we're gonna have an August meeting. We probably will with COVID and stuff, but we'll do it prior to a meeting, which we're already, you're already gonna be obligated yes. to be at, and then doing something like that. Is that a suggestion? I, I'm just trying to. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think we should just go with the September one because even if we don't have an August one, we know we're gonna have a September meeting. Sounds good. And then Jen, can you make sure we're all included on the doodle poll? Thanks. Damien, you got another question, sir? I, I guess to reiterate maybe Lynn's uh, comment on it being sounding disorganized, it, it, are we, I mean, can we legally, are we imposing this on ourselves? I mean, can we do that? Are we voting to all read this or are we just all volunteering and saying that, yeah, okay, we're going to go ahead and read a book? You're, I guess that's the part that I'm. There's no legal obligation. You have all, as a as a working body, you've agreed to read a book, um, and you are as good as your word on whether or not you're going to go read the book to come back and talk about it later. It's not you're not doing any binding vote or policy or anything like that. You're just discussing. This is what you want to do in your own professional development as a working okay. body. Right. We can't make you. <laughs> I'll read it. I'm not saying I don't want to read it. I, just, I think just reiterating that this sounds yeah. kind of confusing. It sounds like we're imposing something on ourselves, and I, I didn't. I, I don't know. I'm sorry if it's not that. I was just trying to be clear, not imposing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Keith, you have a question, sir? Yeah, I just want Bob to pick up a boat, uh, book instead of a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It's beautiful. So are we going to have any more discussion on this? I hate to jump, you know, I try to jump into something different. And if somebody else wants to say anything else, I'm, I'm open, you know, but no one's raising their hand. I can, I can continue on with the agenda. Okay. You want to give us an update on the uh, face covering policy? Darius, please. Yeah. So I made a bigger, we talked about this in the Deerfield meeting. I made a bigger mess than I needed to out of this. But basically, the longer EBCFA is an, is an edited face covering policy of our current policy, which I updated to include the crossing out of um, on you know outdoor, allowing masks to be outdoors by removing some of the language there. What I had done is given you Amherst's policy, which I liked because it basically said we're just going to fall with the DPH. And um, Desi says about masks moving forward, so it would take it off of school committee's hands. I got some resistance on that. On, but at Sunday on Monday and yesterday, and, and then in Deerfield, it was more confusion. Like, Darius, you're just confusing us. And so I said, fine, let's just go to editing our current base policy to allow masks to be off outside. And then when it gets edited again in September, I'll bring it back to you again then. So does that makes sense. So it's getting a little bit later. And so I guess, but when Amherst did that, I was like, wow, I like the way they did it. I should share that. But then we got a really full agenda of other stuff to really go to people. So I'm asking you just to modify your current face cover policy to follow what we're already doing at school. Um, where I made that executive order last month um, to allow masks off outside and, and during those activities. Do I have a motion? So moved. I'll second that. And any other discussion on it? I don't see any hands up or anybody jumping in. Judy? Bob? Yes. 
Lynn? Yeah. Olivia? Yes. Judy? Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yeah. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Bill? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Darius revised non-union personnel handbook. Yes. Um, Shelly and I are gonna both. Shelly, oh, Shelly's there. Good. So with us, Shelly. I'm still here. Shelly did did the lion's share of the work on this, so you get rewarded by having to present it. Um, and I'll present Thanks. my screen the highlights of this thing. This is kind of a thick to be at the end of our meeting after a long meeting here. This is. Yeah. yeah, but it is a, probably one of the thicker things we have to discuss tonight. So, um. so the good news is, even though it is a very dense topic um, at nine o'clock at night, there's not a lot of changes for Frontier outside of formatting and really updating the job classifications. So, if you took the time to look at the handbook that I shared, that was the original handbook you would see one of the biggest changes is job classification. So pretty much the way the handbook was written before was by specific positions. So Darius's secretary, guidance secretary, principal secretary, and you had to jump back and forth in that handbook to remember when it referenced job class ABC is eligible for this benefit, you had to go back to the beginning and remind yourself what was job class ABC. So it was just generally really hard to follow, follow and it was built for specific people at all. That's how it read in my opinion. So first thing we did was look at job classifications and realize that we have um, non-union personnel. So this is custodians, cafeteria staff, secretaries primarily, those are the folks we're talking about. And we have 10 month staff and we have 12 month staff. And then we have a couple of people in union and at Frontier who are like this 10 month plus. So they might work five days before school starts and five days at the end of the year to wrap up things. Guidance tends to be where that happens um, from what I'm seeing. So our recommendation is that we do away with the job class as it's written in the existing handbook and stop being so spe position specific and make it more about the length of year that people work and mimic the benefits, which really is what the handbook had to begin with, but it was just a lot of, you couldn't follow it very easily. So we cleaned it up um, with the job classifications. We updated the hiring requirements so that all of the policies that employees have to agree to um, and abide by when they're first hired, and then when we recertify upon renewal every year, Everything is included according to Donna's list. She's got a checklist that she goes through for each employee. And then the fingerprinting requirements were added because those were also not in there. The handbook, I think, was last updated for Frontier in 18. So there's been some changes legally since then. So we added those pieces in. Um, we did add the Juneteenth holiday, which I know is next on the agenda. It was brought up at a, at a prior meeting, so it's coming to fruition now. That would be for 12-month employees if that um, addition is passed. Uh, vacation time, there was no update from Frontier, right, Darius? Can you scroll down for me? This was all union. We basically are recommending that the union policies so that the principal secretary at Deerfield Elementary gets the same vacation time as the principal secretary at Frontier Regional. Um, so there was no change to the Frontier policy in this regard. Um, although one of the things that is slightly different that we actually put in writing, even though we sort of have been following this practice, is to allow um, the hiring supervisor, which is you know typically a principal or you know, director of facilities or whatever with Darius, to give someone professional credit. It's hard to hire anyone in a professional capacity with no vacation time. So while the handbook still says after one year of service, we do have it in writing here that Darius as the superintendent has discretion to grant um, professional service. I think that that was the one big change of vacation for Frontier. And then sick time, uh, there was one other change for sick time for Frontier. Um, we already had the 20 hour um, work period for any benefits, so that wasn't a change. But what we are recommending to change is that 12 month employees could previously accumulate 150 days. We're recommending 120 days for accumulation 
Um, essentially what this is and what we believe what well, we weren't here when this was written, but you know, a lot of people in this category may not buy optional voluntary disability insurance. So allowing these folks to participate or to accrue 120 days, we're essentially building in a disability policy for them. Most disability policies short term would run six months. So if they have the sick time available and they get the medical certification that they need, we're saying let's give them that 120 days. So this is the one spot where I think there's a loss in the benefit. 150 felt like it was a bit extreme um, because the school will be on the line for some financial impact here. If it's a custodian, you know, we may have to have a substitute come in or um, I actually have someone in the business office who's going out for um, shoulder surgery coming up. And so I can't go three months without having bills paid and she's our accounts payable person. So there is some cost to it. And, you know, we thought that bringing it down a little bit would be um, still giving the employee adequate time and then also take care of the school on the same side. Uh, so longevity benefit, there was no change here in the longevity for Frontier. Again, matching union to um, Frontier was really what we were looking at for equity in like positions. And so far, Deerfield and Frontier have adopted all of the changes. Uh, the retirement, there was a change for Frontier. So currently, Frontier employees that fall under this personnel handbook get two days of sick time buyback for every year of service. Um, we are recommending we grandfather in any existing staff, but as of July 1, we cap the paid time uh, for the sick buyback at 45 days for any new hires, which similar to our conversations around changing teacher contracts um, at the union because Frontier has already done this, but you know it's not going to impact us for some time, but moving forward in the future, it will save the district some money to do this. And this is in alignment with our IA contracts. Um, which, you know, these are similar hourly positions. Um, so that's what we're hoping to move forward with here. I know it's a lot and it's late and you probably <laughs> haven't had time to read the whole um, handbooks because I did just send them out today. The other thing is, is that you get that two policy reading rule. So you don't have to vote on this tonight. Um, if you don't vote on it tonight, we'll bring it back for the next meeting so that you can process and you know, read it thoroughly. There's no pressure to do it. We will ask for it to go retroactively back to July when we when it is voted on. Did I miss anything? I'm tired myself right now, so I don't know if I even got that all in there, Darius. Let's make a. What's um? I don't have a problem with voting on this tonight. That way, we can get it done. Does anybody else have anything they want to share, or you want to wait until September, Keith? I'll just say we looked at this last night with Sunderland, and it was more, I feel like it was more in line of uh, moving the elementary schools in line with the uh, with the high school rather than the other way around. Lynn, do you have a question? Not a question. I would just like to have more time to read through this and really think about the ramifications of it all. Okay, we can put we can we can put it off to September. Someone want to Keith? If we vote on it in September, will it be uh, retroactive? Yes. Right? You would be yeah, able to retroactive except those who would be grandfather clause and on the July one date. Those two those uh, those things where we said that the 45 days people hired after. So anybody hired in that range. Um, and when you I'm thinking about it. I don't think anybody's due to be hired in, in, in our staff. You got to remember, this is all non-union people. So, um, it's, you know, we were talking about it's, uh, well, there's more, you know, frontier than anybody else. But, um, yeah, I don't see there's going to be any movement. There's no projected movement right now. So, you'd be fine. No, and there's, there's nothing that impacts anyone immediately. So, no one's losing a benefit by not making the change on July 1. A lot of it, like I said, for Frontier is really restructuring what the handbook looks like so it reads easier for new hires, for existing employees, and for us as administration to process. So, um, you know, I think like Darius said, if we wait till September, then all we do is change the date if everything else is approved so that that last retirement piece, 9-1, say, is the 
at the, of the date where everyone else is grandfathered in. There could be some, I don't think even at Frontier, I was gonna say there could be a cafeteria or a custodial change, but I'm not even sure that custodial maybe, but cafeteria I think is looking pretty good right now. And all of our secretaries and things as far as we know are in place. So it wouldn't have an immediate impact if you wait. Lynn, you got a question? I do. How many people are changes like in um, in sick time accruement? How many people are going to be impacted by that in a negative way? Uh, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. I could get back to you, though, with an update on that. Um, I think in my quick look, I know that there are a few people that we haven't even necessarily stuck to the policy of a maximum of, uh, of 150 days. So this could be also something that we look at grandfathering in a certain population. Um, you know, we haven't been consistent with policies over the years in this regard. So there could be a custodian or um, a business office person right now who has 300 sick days accumulated. But remember, those wrapping your head around this, there's no, you don't just you 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 max out the amount of days you get bought out at. So those other things are just an insurance policy, which you also have to have doctor's notes for and that kind of stuff. It's not like you can just, you know, stub your foot and go out for six months. Like we, we you have to we have to follow the required FMLA paperwork and all the other kind of stuff. So um so you yeah, correct. Me we could you say we'll grandfather in on that, Shelly, perhaps? We could if if that's what you know the committee wanted to do, we definitely could. <clears throat> but I'd like to look at the numbers. I'd like to pull you that data, and that way you have real information to consider. So we're going to go ahead, Missy. One other thing to think about is the mass um, state-funded FMLA that is now available for, for folks. Um, so uh, not just using their sick time, but if people are out for an extended period of time, they do have access to state funds now for some of that. So just uh, kind of throw a wrench in your thinking as you're trying to trying to look at that stuff. So does that apply to us? I think unless it changed, I think as a municipality, which we're technically considered as a regional school, we are exempt from participating in the Massachusetts paid family medical. I believe that's correct. Really? We could we could choose as a municipality to opt into it um, if we wanted to do that for folks. And then we would take payroll deductions because that's how it works is people basically are prepaying for their sick time. Right. Um, but as a uh, like any city, town, school, you're exempt. <laughs> Wow. Are, okay, you saying that, on, are you saying that when people go out on leave for say surgery that they can't access the family medical leave act they can yeah. access the federal the family medical leave federally but the new massachusetts paid family medical leave that started was it last january not this January, I think it was January year before. Yeah. Um, local, I mean, municipal agencies and state agencies are exempt from the requirement to participate. So if we were a private organization, I think you have to have 50 or more employees, but I could have that number confused with something else. If we were private, you would be required to take money from your employees' paychecks, basically, and that goes to the state and the state holds it so that if you do need FMLA, you're getting some, it's a cap at a certain amount paid back to you. Um, so they still get FMLA, but it's not necessarily the same as what the state is giving. There's federal law and state law. FMLA is so confusing. I think we talk about it every single day, Darius. Do we every not? Day we call a lawyer once every two weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure, and I've form. actually <laughs> asked them several times about paid family medical leave with Massachusetts, which is why I was like, wait, Missy, do you know something I don't know? Because I every time it comes up, I go back and shoot an email. Are you sure that this, but it's written right into the law that 
were exempt. I did not know that. Thank you. So we, we're going to table this until September. Is that what I have for a census? Do we have to vote on tabling it? Darius? No, no, because you get, you with, with any no, policy, you get that second read, right? So we're right. presenting it to you. You process it, and it'll come up for vote next time. Thank you, Shelley. If you're sure. tabling your second read, you have to vote it, I think, to show that the committee agrees with you tabling it, therefore you don't act as a dictator. <clears throat> Me? It might. All right. Okay. Uh, a new holiday or a holiday for, is this for non-union? So, so Juneteenth has been um, signed off by Governor Baker as a uh, state holiday. However, um, you, municipalities, whether or not it's paid or not, is up to um, our governing bodies. So um, right now, um, so right now it's, it's this year is falling on a Saturday. Um, so it wouldn't be, a, actually you could vote it in to be that, but we're looking to do this for the following year. Let's just put it that way. Um, so right now, um, let me pull up my, I have, you know what, I have a little sheet here. Let me just share my screen. Is this, this, this going to be one of those holidays when it's during the weekend, they're going to have Mondays off for to make it a three-day? You day? betcha. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> So this is the word proposing all 12 month employees eligible for paid holidays will have Juneteenth as a paid holiday beginning in June, 2022. Juneteenth will be treated the same as holidays that may fall on the weekend. If Juneteenth falls on a Saturday, 12 month employees will have proceeding fr Friday off as a holiday. If the Juneteenth falls on Sunday, 12 month school employees will have the Monday off as a holiday. Um, um, there was questions at the Sunderland meeting about can you have flexibility? I actually wrote that in when they were talking about it and I never deleted it, but I'll, since it's there, you know, like let's say the school year ended on you know, like the, the 19th or something like that. So that means you have to go, it was, a, it was a Friday and that means you have to go the following week. Could we shift that holiday? We started going down that rabbit hole and then we realized like the holiday is to recognize, um, you know, you know, is to recognize, um, you know, the end of slavery and, um, you know, there's a date on that, you know what I mean? So we just even were conscious about, we shouldn't be moving it around at our convenience of the school schedule. It really, it should be, um, we put in place and we build a school schedule, we're just going to be cognizant of that. That it doesn't fit well with school calendars because we usually end school between the 18th and the 22nd on most normal years. So it's going to impact that um, moving forward. Um, and then for all union employees, um, unit, this is really talking about Unit C because Unit A does not receive paid holiday. Um, we would discuss that next year is the negotiation year. We would discuss that, um, what we want to do um, with those people um, and such as part of the collective bargaining. I think it's something obviously we want to be pushing forward to do, but it's part of that conversation. So that's what I'm proposing. You guys take it from there. Joey, did I miss anything? Hello? Anybody want to make a motion? I'd love to make a motion, but I'm not entirely sure what I'm voting on anymore. Like, and that may just be the end of the night situation, but we're voting on, <laughs> Darius just threw something up. So we're not voting on unit C or A, that's next year. We're only voting on 12 month Nine. employees, it's on a Saturday, they get Friday. If it's on a Sunday, they get Monday. So you're just going to recognize, we're going to recognize um, Juneteenth as a holiday and 12-month um, employees will be paid, for 12-month employees, it'll be a paid holiday. The rest of that usually falls, when it's going to be celebrated, it's going to be set automatically like we set every other holiday that falls on weekends. It's a kind of the standard formula. Perfect. Clears it right up. I'll make a motion. Second. Thanks, Bill. Anybody Roll call. Have, any other discussion on it? Okay, go ahead, Judy. 
Tom? Yes. Uh, Lynn? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Uh, Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Lucy? Yes. Bill? Yeah. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I, I have nothing as a chair. Uh, Lynn, do we have anything from the collaborative? Um, well, you know that William Deal, Bill Deal left in December, and we now have a new executive director. His name is Todd uh, Gazda, G-A-Z-D-A. He's currently the superintendent of Ludlow Schools. Oh, I got is he going to hold both positions, or is he going to? No, God, no. no. <laughs> I, I don't know. So he's a he's a collaborative um, new executive director. All right, Darius will be one. Darius will be it in twenty years. <laughs> Actually, his his father was my high school principal, and he went to school with my brother a couple years above me. Wow, Gateway graduates. So he's a Western Mass guy and small school guys, regional guy. So. Um, He's a good person. Good. I had a few dates with his sister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, George. Hey, George. Hey, George. It's it's nine. Hi, hi, Bob. Um, I'll so, mention uh, you Damien at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> So I know that everybody got my report, um, but I just want to just run through a few things. Uh, just once again, so we had our graduation ceremonies on um, last Friday. Uh, they were um, a wonderful success. It was it was great to have everybody there. Um, I want to I want to echo what Carl had said earlier. Thanks uh, thanks to the school committee and everything that you guys did to make sure that our seniors had a year this year. So that was wonderful. I want to also give a big thank you to our senior class advisor Melissa Strelke. She did so much for those kids. She was she was amazing. Um, the, the, the speakers did a great job. Um, it was just, it was a lovely night and, and it was just great to, it was great to, to sort of cap off our year with that. So, um, so, so thank you. Um, I do want to publicly also recognize, um, we've got three folks retiring this year. Um, we have Maureen Collins, who's a middle school math teacher. We have Laura Senkowitz, who's a high school special education teacher. And we have Denise Sittler, who's our, our strings teacher. They're all very caring and dedicated teachers and, and we're gonna miss them dearly. So I uh, just wanna wish them well as, the, as they move forward uh, with the next chapter in their lives. Um, and then just a few things, just sort of like, just so you guys know some logistical things that are happening in and around the building this summer. Um, so we are refinishing and resurfacing the gym floor uh, and we're gonna paint a new logo uh, on the gym floor as well. Uh, we're putting additional lockers up on the second floor across from the LMC. And as you know, we've begun work on the track as well. So, so we're going to be, it's going to be busy in the building. Um, we're also going to be doing summer school um, for high school and for middle school. And this is going to, we're going to be doing credit recovery for high school um, for uh, English, math, social studies, and science. So there's going to be a lot going on this summer. We're going to be busy, um, but uh, we're looking forward to it. So yeah, I don't know if anybody has any questions or or comments. Thank you, George. Darius, what do you have for us tonight? Uh, no formal report. I kind of went over some of the other things in my other as I went through things throughout the evening. Um, but I do want to, you know, kind of pick up where George left off and just thank um, just the entire community. As we kind of this kind of is our, our, our June meeting and just to kind of recognize the amount of work that this year starting you know every group of people within our schools you know starting you know with our teachers our ias our custodians cafeteria um our administrators and of course all of you I mean, it's just been a long year and in that in that graduation kind of showed it was a kind of like a celebration that we made it and it kind of closed out that year of of, of with some normalcy at the end but it was so i mean you can think back to where we were in august meeting after meeting like, what are we going to do um, and where we are now? And we got through it still as one community. We got through it as one, this body is one really well-oiled machine working group. Um, and it couldn't have been done with all the, the integral people um, that work for, essentially work for all of us um, in, the, in, the, in the teachers and in the, in the um, IAs and such. And then also thank you to the families who, 
did have to be extremely flexible dealing with rules that we had no control over. I'm just putting that out there, some of those things we didn't have control over. And also, you know, um, and then kind of conforming to what we were able to provide. And I think we were a leader in the area and I'm proud of that factor, um, but we couldn't have done it without working all together. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. And um, I want to say uh, that next September, it's going to be good to see everybody, uh, hopefully in person, back to our regular schedule. Um, you know, I only do this with you guys. I know some of you do a lot of other meetings on the computer. I, I, I couldn't be in front of this for five or six hours a day like some of you guys are. So I'm going to be happy to get back in person meetings. And um, we'll see you. You know, hopefully they voted me in tonight for school committee. So we'll see <laughs> No one was running against me that I know of, but who knows, you know? We but, have a new selectman. We have a new selectman, Bob. I got a pop mm -hmm. up. Uh, that wasn't a surprise. Yep. But, you know, everybody have a great summer. And like Derry said, we might have to meet in August, but um, everybody have a good summer and a, uh, hopefully a good vacation. So uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll Back. second that. Third. Raise your hands. You know the drill. All right. Hey, good night, everybody.